Today's video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. No matter where you live in the world, Surfshark gives you the ability to have a virtual private network, allowing you a safer online experience where you can securely access public Wi-Fi as well as send and receive files without the risk of online hacking or phishing. And of course, one of Surfshark's most popular use cases is the ability to unlock different countries' streaming services through the godsend of geo-blocking. Yes, no matter where you're located worldwide, just connect to the country of your choice and refresh the page, access granted. We've used this before ourselves with the likes of Disney Plus and Netflix to open a whole new library of content, allowing us to watch shows exclusive to the UK, Canada, and Australia. Support the channel by using the link in the description and save 83% today with the code WRESTLEWITHANDY as well as getting three extra months for free. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's video. In the annals of WWE history, there have been many big names that have come and gone. Names like Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart, Steve Austin, John Cena, and Roman Reigns. Throughout all of these runs, there is one who's remained a constant. He's a figure that could always be counted on, someone who, across the space of five decades, was able to build a career unlike anyone else in the industry, and that man is The Undertaker. Yes, from the golden era to the new generation, from the Attitude Era to ruthless aggression and beyond, the Dead Man is in our opinion the greatest character in WWE history. So how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into his entire career journey in Phenom The Undertaker Story. Mark William Calloway was born on March 24, 1965 in Houston, Texas to parents Frank and Betty. And along with his four older brothers, David, Michael, Paul, and Timothy, the future dead man would grow up in a happy family there, attending nearby Waltrip High School and becoming a key member of both their football and basketball teams. Yes, at 6 foot 10 by that point, Mark felt like a natural for the sports world, and that was why, upon graduating, he would begin studying at Angelina College on a basketball scholarship, all before moving on to Texas Wesleyan University, where he would become a star member of their hoops team, the Rams, during the 1985-1986 to season. And that's where it seemed like his career was headed upon leaving Texas Wesleyan then, with him at this point hoping to start a lengthy run on the court. In the end, though, it would be another industry that called to him, one he had been a fan of as a child, and that was professional wrestling. It started in late 1986, when Mark began being trained by Buzz Sawyer. Soon after that, he would get a job with World Class Championship Wrestling, there working under a mask and initially going by the name of Texas Red. And in a debut worthy of the figure he would later become, his first match would actually see him be managed to the ring by Percy Pringle, as he went up against the legendary Bruiser Brody in a losing effort. Following this auspicious debut, Mark would move over to the Continental Wrestling Association for a while, there being managed by Dutch Mantel and working under a number of gimmicks, including the Master of Pain and the Punisher, the former of which saw him defeat Jerry Lawler to become the USWA Unified World Champion, and the latter of which saw him pin Eric Embry to win the WCWA Texas Heavyweight title. Yes, it was a lot of early success for the young rookie to find coming his way, but by this point, he was already able to carry himself like a pro both on and off screen, quickly gaining the respect of his peers in the process and becoming known as someone who could be counted on. And this reputation would follow him to World Championship Wrestling after that as, in 1990, he would make his debut there now working under the name of Mean Mark Callis, as he played a more gothic-inspired character, one which was described by commentator Jim Ross as being a fan of Ozzy Osbourne and Pet Snakes. So, with this new gimmick established, Mean Mark would begin teaming with Dan Spivey, as the two became known as the Skyscrapers, a pairing that saw the youngster find further success when they got into a notable program with the Road Warriors. Soon after that, though, the Texas boy would be told by the company's booker at the time, Ole Anderson, that he had no real future with WCW, as in his words, no one would ever pay to watch him perform. How wrong this turned out to be then, and intent on proving Ole was short-sighted, Mark would begin to rethink where his future lay, quietly running down his contract from there as he took up a small role in the Hulk Hogan vehicle Suburban Commando, filmed in early 1990. 
and this would put him under the radar of the Hulkster himself, who quickly reported back to his boss about the potential star that was out there and looking to make a move as soon as possible. This was how, later that year, once his contract had expired, Mark would meet up with Vince McMahon, with the boss surprisingly not seeing much in the future WWE Champion himself at this point. Thankfully, this attitude would change, however, and after getting a chance to know him, Vince quickly realized he had to sign the up-and-comer to a contract as, from there, he would begin formulating a new character for him to debut under. And this gimmick, of course, would end up going down as arguably the greatest in the industry's history, The Undertaker, an undead Old West-style mortician hailing from Death Valley who apparently felt no pain and who would dispose of his opponents in body bags after defeating them. Of course, it seems obvious now that this would be a success, but when compared to some of the other terrible gimmicks of the era, it really could have failed miserably had it not been for the man portraying the character and the commitment he showed it, proving the old adage that there are no bad roles, only bad actors. Yes, Mark fully lived and breathed the role from minute one as, after doing a couple of test runs on the house show circuit as Kane the Undertaker, he'd make his formal debut as a surprise entrant at the Survivor Series on November 22nd of that year, coming out with Brother Love by his side to one of the best entrance themes in WWE history and quickly impressing audiences when he laid waste to Coco Beware with his signature Tombstone Piledriver, then eliminated Dusty Rhodes as well for good measure. After that, he would go on a tear through the company, destroying everyone he came up against and striking fear into fans' hearts every time he came through the curtain. One change that did happen here, though, was that he would drop Brother Love as his manager, with him reuniting with his old friend Percy Pringle instead, someone who is now portraying the character of Paul Bearer, the holder of the mysterious urn which apparently gave the dead man all of his powers. This then led to WrestleMania 7 on March 24th, 1991 where, in a match that would begin a near two and a half decade long tradition, The Undertaker would defeat Superfly Jimmy Snuka after hitting him with a tombstone. Following that, he would get into a feud with the Ultimate Warrior which would carry on for a while until the Warrior was fired from the company later that year. But that wouldn't do anything to slow down the dead man's progress as, by then, heel or not, he was growing in popularity to the point that some fans were even beginning to cheer for him. And this would ultimately lead to him not only challenging Hulk Hogan at the November 27th, 1991 Survivor Series, but actually beating him to become the, at the time, youngest WWE Champion. Due to the nature of the finish that night though, with Ric Flair getting heavily involved, the title would end up being vacated days later. But even if it was only brief, the fact that the company saw enough in their new signing to not only hold the belt, but to get a rare victory over the Hulkster, proved just how much they saw in him going forward. And this faith they had in him would become even more apparent as 1992 rolled around, as at WrestleMania 8, The Undertaker would continue his winning streak when he beat Jake the Snake Roberts and sent him packing from the company for the next four years. More important than that though, this program would actually see the dead man turn babyface for the first time as, from there, he would become a firm fan favorite for the next few years. But despite his new alignment, this period would be marred by a series of pretty terrible feuds that saw him have to go up against the monster of that particular month, with these usually being people who had limited skill inside the ring but could match him in size. And with Mark's character at this time necessitating that he be less of a great in-ring worker and more of a dominating figure who didn't sell anything, it all led to some pretty terrible bouts as he went up against the likes of Kamala and Giant Gonzalez, the latter of whom would give The Undertaker his third WrestleMania victory at WrestleMania 9 on April 4th, 1993 after he got himself disqualified in the bout. Luckily though, there was one opponent who the Texan could put on a good match with during this period, and that was Yokozuna, as the two would end up having a pretty memorable casket match at the 1994 Royal Rumble. This one, however, would end with the dead man losing, then appearing to ascend to the heavens after the fact, something done in the spirit of his supernatural gimmick so as to give him some time off to recover from a back injury. But this did mean he would miss WrestleMania for the first time in his WWE career, with him not returning until that year's SummerSlam, at which point the run of terrible programs would continue when he and Paul Bearer got into a feud with Ted DiBiase, the very man who had kayfabe brought him into the company, and his fake Undertaker, portrayed by Mark's real-life friend Brian Lee. 
Yes, at this point, with the growing influence of Shawn Michaels, Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, Triple H, and Shawn Waltman's backstage click, the dead man had taken to asserting his influence as a locker room leader by forming his own group to counteract them. With the Bone Street crew, as they would come to be known, consisting of, among other associates, Yokozuna, Savio Vega, Charles Wright, The Godwins, and Rikishi. And so respected was The Undertaker by then, not even the click would dare mess with him as he became the regular judge in wrestler's court, an impromptu court held by the performers backstage whenever a perceived infraction had occurred. Meanwhile, as this was going on, in his personal life, Mark was getting married to his first wife, Jody Lynn, with the two later following this up with the birth of their son, Gunner. Back in the ring, however, the Phenom, as he was then becoming known, would continue his reign of dominance when his character began to morph away from the undead zombie mortician into a more godlike gothic figure who could call down lightning at will and control the lighting of the arena with a simple raise of his hands. And this new incarnation would serve him well, as at WrestleMania 11 on April 2nd, 1995, he would rack up another victory in his WrestleMania win streak when he defeated King Kong Bundy. After that, an orbital bone injury would see him have to wear a face mask to the ring for a while as he continued his seemingly endless feud with Ted DiBiase's Million Dollar Corporation. That would be until late 95, at which point the dead man would re-enter the main event scene when he got into a program with Diesel, with this one seeing the two face off at WrestleMania 12 as the Texas boy made it 5-0 at the Showcase of the Immortals. The next night, however, he would face his greatest challenge yet when Mankind would debut in WWE, with him subsequently doing what no one else had been able to do thus far when he repeatedly got the better of The Undertaker, proving to be a continued thorn in his side and leading to them eventually settling things in a boiler room brawl at August 1996's SummerSlam. And on that night, not only would Mankind shock the world by beating The Undertaker, but he would also steal his manager away from him as Paul Bearer would abandon his client, with this only serving to take things to new levels of heat, as at October 20th's In Your House 11 Buried Alive, the two wrestlers would face off in the first ever Buried Alive match, a match that would see the dead man six feet under come the end. Still, living up to his status as a seemingly unkillable figure, he would make his return at November 17th's Survivor Series to get his revenge, with him now sporting another slightly updated look that saw him present himself as the more demonic Lord of Darkness. And after finally getting the victory over Mankind that night, the now solo Undertaker would spend early 1997 returning to the WWE title picture when, after a controversial finish to that year's Royal Rumble, he would eventually find himself going one-on-one -on -one with Psycho Sid for the belt at WrestleMania 13, with his victory that night marking not only the beginning of his second run with the top prize, but his sixth consecutive victory on the grandest stage of them all. Following this, his most memorable storyline in WWE to date would begin as Paul Bearer would re-enter his life, now hoping to reacquire his services, given his status as WWE Champion. And of course, initially The Undertaker would refuse this overture, but that would only lead to Bearer blackmailing the Phenom, claiming that if he didn't let him manage him again, then he would reveal his darkest secret to the world. So feeling like he had no choice, the champion would allow his former manager back into his circle, with this carrying on for a while afterwards, up until the point that he decided he couldn't take it anymore, that was, and he instead chose to reject Bearer. And this would lead to the manager revealing his former client's secret to the world, that he had a brother, one named Kane, who had been thought dead for many years but was actually still alive and looking for revenge. Yes, it was WWE at its telenovela best, and in the months that followed, Paul Bearer would continually remind audiences that Kane was coming, as he now knew the truth, that The Undertaker had been the one responsible for a fire that killed their parents years prior, and left him with severe burns. This storyline then would continue to run in the background as the dead man continued to defend his WWE title over the course of the spring and summer, with it all eventually getting to him and contributing towards him losing the belt to Bret Hart at August 3rd, 1997's SummerSlam. Then, to make matters worse, after getting into a heated blood feud with Shawn Michaels, one which would climax in the first ever Hell in a Cell match at October 5th's In Your House Bad Blood, Kane would finally make his debut to cost his brother the bout in question, a bout that would end up being one of the greatest in WWE history and the first sign that, when given the chance, Mark Calloway really could go in the ring. Still, 
This did little to make him feel better following the reintroduction of his brother, someone who, with Paul Bearer by his side, would spend the upcoming weeks and months demanding that The Undertaker meet him in the ring. Unwilling to face his own flesh and blood, however, the Phenom would refuse these demands, leading to Kane instead taking out his rage on the rest of the roster as he laid waste to the likes of Mankind and Vader from there. But for as bleak as things looked, at one point there did appear to be a moment when the two siblings finally saw eye to eye again, their familial bond able to overcome any hatred between them. That would happen in the lead up to the 1998 Royal Rumble when, after D-Generation X had been making his brother's life a living hell, Kane would come out to the rescue, seemingly reuniting the two once more. That though would turn out to be a ruse, as during The Undertaker's WWE title casket match against Shawn Michaels at the aforementioned show, Kane would come out to cost him the victory, from there taking the casket his own flesh and blood was now trapped in and setting it on fire. But with his apparent supernatural powers, the Texan was somehow able to avoid death once again here as, after disappearing for a few weeks, he would return just prior to WrestleMania 14 to announce that he'd decided enough was enough and he would indeed face off against Kane at the biggest show of the year. And when that match came, despite it representing his toughest challenge yet, The Undertaker would eventually put his brother down after giving him three tombstone pile drivers, with this taking his record to 7-0. After that, the feud between the two would continue on for the rest of the year, as the next month, they returned to take each other on in the first ever Inferno match, with the dead man winning this one too. Once that was done, the babyface would take a brief detour when, while Kane was feuding with Stone Cold Steve Austin over the WWE title, he would instead reignite his program with Mankind, with this one ending up giving fans probably the most insane and iconic bump in wrestling history. Yes, it was at the June 28th King of the Ring pay-per-view that the two would meet inside Hell in a Cell. Though this time, they would of course start the match on top of the cell, something which led to The Undertaker throwing Mankind off of it sending him crashing down through an announce table 16 feet below in a moment that still, to this day, stands as arguably the most shocking moment in wrestling history. And he wasn't done there, as after chokeslamming him through the cage, then backdropping him into thumbtacks, the Phenom would mercifully end things with a victory after 17 minutes. Following this, he would re-enter the world title picture when he started a feud with Steve Austin, one that would see the two briefly be forced to coexist when they became tag team champions together during the build. By the time it got to August 30th SummerSlam though, there was no teamwork to be found as they would now go one on one with the title on the line. But what made this one even more interesting was that, in the weeks prior, it looked as though the challenger had finally been able to mend fences with his brother. And while Kane didn't interfere in the match that night, ultimately allowing Austin to pick up the win in the end, not long after the show, it would be confirmed that they were indeed a unit once more. That brief union would collapse come the end of the year, however, as by October, The Undertaker would have turned heel on his brother, aligning himself with Paul Bearer again and confirming that, yes, he had been the one responsible for his parents' death. This would see him morph his character into more of a dark priest who wore a hooded black robe and sat upon a throne of evil as he formed a Ministry of Darkness around him, an unholy group that included the likes of the Acolytes, the Brood, Midian, Viscera, and the Big Show. And that group really began to heat up as 1999 rolled around, as it was then where the Lord of Darkness would begin to set his sights on Vince McMahon himself. Yes, in a storyline that blurred the lines between reality and fiction, The Undertaker would enact a hostile takeover attempt of the company, terrorizing the McMahon family at all turns, all while Vince himself would lambaste him for getting lost in the character that had been created for him. But lost in the character or not, Mark Calloway would continue to go after the boss and his corporation, even going as far as to hang the big boss man during the best left forgotten Hell in a Cell match the two had at WrestleMania 15 one only worth noting for the fact that it took the streak to 8-0. After that, he would try to kidnap and marry Stephanie McMahon in an eldritch ceremony on the April 26, 1999 episode of Raw, something he claimed was being done so as to please the mysterious higher power who had secretly been pulling the strings of the ministry behind the scenes. Of course, on that night, however, he would be stopped by Stone Cold Steve Austin, and this would lead to the two facing off for the WWE title again at May 23rd's Over the Edge pay-per-view, 
a match which The Undertaker would ultimately win so as to start his third reign on top. And so now, riding high, two weeks after that, he would finally reveal to the world that the higher power was Vince McMahon all along. Yes, it didn't make any sense at the time, and in the years following it, it's become infamous for being one of the worst reveals in WWE history. Still, at least he had the WWE title around his waist. That was until the June 28th episode of Raw, as it was then that the Rattlesnake would get his rematch, there taking the belt back home for himself after the two were able to draw the highest rated segment in WWE history at that point. Soon after this, the Ministry would disband too, with The Undertaker continuing to work as a tag team with The Big Show for a while, as he took the relative rookie under his wing. And that period would even see them become tag team champions together on two separate occasions, all while the dead man began to transition his look away from the dark priest he had been into something more closely resembling his real life personality. The rumored reason for this, if you believe Kevin Nash of course, is that the WWE stalwart was thinking of jumping ship to WCW, and so was preparing a new gimmick for himself ahead of time, something which seems unlikely given that company's position by then and Mark Calloway's steadfast devotion to the McMahon family over the years. Still, he obviously realized that he needed to change things up again regardless, and that was why, after disappearing for a while in September of 1999 to deal with a groin tear and also to get married to his second wife Sarah, he would return at May 21st 2000's Judgment Day pay-per-view to debut a radically different incarnation of his character, the American Badass. Yes, gone was the gothic leaning and the supernatural abilities as, coming to the decision that he wanted to play something closer to himself, The Undertaker would now be portrayed as a rough-hewn, ass-kicking biker, someone who would come to the ring on his Harley Davidson decked out in denim and leather, all while the sounds of Kid Rock's American Badass, and then later Limp Biscuit's Rollin', would blare out behind him. And while this change was certainly jarring to some, fans quickly took to it as the former WWE Champion was able to completely reinvent himself and give his character, one which by all rights should have lasted a year at most, an entirely new lease on life. It would see him become even more dominant than before in fact, as after briefly feuding with Kane again, the two would team up once more to form the Brothers of Destruction. But that didn't mean he wouldn't continue as a singles wrestler too, as it was here that, now free of the limitations of the dead man character, the American Badass got a chance to regularly have great matches for the first time against the likes of Kurt Angle, Rikishi, and The Rock. Then in early 2001, he would start a program with Triple H that would lead to probably his best WrestleMania match ever to that point, one which would see him ultimately defeat the game at WrestleMania 17 to take his record to 9-0. And it appears it was somewhere around this time that it was pointed out to Mark Calloway backstage that he'd never actually lost at WrestleMania, something which the company should play up going forward. Yes, while it might seem like it had been the plan all along, the first decade or so of the streak was pure luck and coincidence. But his next chance to get a victory at the grandest stage of them all wouldn't come for another year yet, and in the meantime, The Undertaker had a lot to accomplish namely winning the tag team titles with Kane, something he was able to do on the April 19th episode of SmackDown. After that, they would feud with the two-man power trip of Steve Austin and Triple H for a while, all up until the point that WCW would invade WWE and start one of the most disappointing angles in the industry's history. And for the American Badass's part, this meant feuds with the likes of Diamond Dallas Page and Chronic, the former of which would see the three-time WCW champion left to look like an absolute geek, and the latter of which would give us one of the worst tag team matches in memory. Still, it wasn't all bad, as during this period, the Brothers of Destruction would be able to win the WCW tag team titles, then even help to send the invading force packing during the winner-takes-all match at that November's Survivor Series. And as if this wasn't enough, in his personal life around this time, the former three-time WWE Champion and his wife Sarah would have two daughters together, Chasey and Gracie. Back in the ring, however, with the invasion angle over and WCW thoroughly defeated, The Undertaker would surprise everyone when he turned heel once again, this time morphing his character again as he became known as Big Evil someone who knew he was the toughest dog in the yard, and that, if you wanted to challenge him for the spot, he was more than willing to make you famous. Which led up to the 2002 Royal Rumble match where, in a huge upset moment, 
tough enough rookie Maven was able to eliminate Big Evil, but this seeing the two feud for a while thereafter as the legend helped to give the up-and-comer the rub. Yes, The Undertaker could rarely be described as a selfish man when it came to helping others below him on the card, and this was one of the reasons that, come WrestleMania 18 on March 17, 2002, he was rewarded with a dream match when he got to face off against Ric Flair, there defeating him to take his record to 10-0. After that, during the inaugural draft, he would be picked up by Raw exclusively, as he there quickly challenged and defeated a returning Hulk Hogan to become WWE Undisputed Champion. So over the next few months, Big Evil would be required to act as a traveling champion then, going between both the red and blue brands and taking on all comers as he helped to elevate the likes of Jeff Hardy, all before eventually losing the belt to The Rock in a triple threat match that also included Kurt Angle at July 21st's Vengeance. Following this, he would move over to SmackDown full-time, where he would enter into a program with the new champion Brock Lesnar, there helping to put the youngster over strong in a great Hell in a Cell match at October 20th's No Mercy that saw them never once have to leave the cage. Then, after taking another short break, he would return in early 2003 to start a storyline that saw him train newcomer Nathan Jones in preparation for what was supposed to be a tag match seeing the two take on Big Show and A-Train at WrestleMania 19. Unfortunately though, Nathan Jones was a terrible wrestler who was nowhere near TV ready and so, when the time came to enter the ring on March 30th, the whole thing was changed into a handicap match instead, where after beating his two opponents, The Undertaker's streak would move up to 11-0. By now however, it felt like this newer incarnation of his character was beginning to run its course, as fans were becoming more and more vocal about their desire to see the dead man return. And that was why, after spending the rest of the year having good matches against the likes of John Cena, Kurt Angle, and Brock Lesnar, the Texas native would disappear for a while again following a loss to Vince McMahon himself in a Buried Alive match at November 16th Survivor Series, something which was done so as to not only allow him time to rethink where his character was going next, but also allow him time to grieve over the death of his father. And when he finally did return at WrestleMania 20 on March 14th, 2004, fans were delighted to see him back, not only because they'd missed him, but because, finally, he would return to the Dead Man gimmick, though this time with something that retained certain elements of his biker character, allowing him to continue to have the great matches he'd been putting on in the years prior. But that wasn't all he brought back that night as, with Paul Bearer by his side once again, he was able to defeat his brother Kane for the second time at the biggest show of the year to rack up his 12th straight win. Following that, he would continue to be managed by Bearer for a while as he got into feuds with the likes of the Dudley Boys, JBL, and Randy Orton, the latter of whom would actually be his opponent at the following year's WrestleMania. And this is really where the streak started to become a thing as, with Orton's legend killer gimmick and status as one of the company's top rising stars, there were many in the crowd that night at WrestleMania 21 who actually believed he was going to defeat the Phenom. This then led to some crazy near falls that left the audience on the edge of their seat throughout, a formula that would be replicated every year from then on in. Ultimately though, it would be the Texan who got the victory come the end of the match, taking his record to 13-0. And part of the reason he'd been able to keep winning against younger guys was that, having become a fan of MMA, he'd started to incorporate elements of this into his ring work, using submission moves such as the Goga Plata to give him an extra edge whenever he needed it. And this also had the knock-on effect of seeing him have some of the best bouts of his career going forward as, over the rest of 2005, he would get into a controversial feud with Muhammad Hassan, one which ended with that character having to be pulled from TV after a segment aping a terrorist attack was aired on the same day as the 7-7 London bombings. So putting this behind him, he would resume his program with Randy Orton, eventually doing the honors for him in a match at both that August SummerSlam and that October's No Mercy. And following his loss at the latter pay-per-view, the dead man would be taken off TV for a month, just enough time so as to allow him to return at November's Survivor Series and stake his claim for one more bout against the legend killer inside his own specialty match, Hell in a Cell. Given the match he was about to enter then, this period would see The Undertaker lean more and more into the supernatural elements of his character as, over the next few weeks, he would begin to torment Orton by doing things such as seemingly possessing backstage interviewers and talking through them, 
and this allowed him to get in the head of his opponent enough that, come the time of the match on December 18th, he would get the final victory over the up-and-comer, putting things to bed once and for all. So from there, looking for something new to sink his teeth into, the Phenom would get into a short program with Kurt Angle in early 2006 that actually saw the legend not only lose, but tap out to the Olympic hero in a sign of just how much he respected him. After that, he'd prepare himself for his next match at WrestleMania 22, a match that was originally supposed to see him face off against Angle once more as he became the one to finally end the streak. Before that could come to pass, however, plans would change, and instead, while Kurt was interjected into the World Heavyweight title picture, the dead man would face off against Mark Henry in a casket match, one he would win after just over 9 minutes to take his tally to 14-0. And following this, his career hit a temporary lull when he was forced to try and get a good match out of the Great Khali, something which even Mark Calloway wasn't capable of as it turned out. Yes, it seemed like his career was taking a few steps back given how much he'd already proven he can go in the ring, but powering through it anyway, he would do his best to entertain fans as they met in the ring at May's Judgment Day, and then again on the August 18th edition of SmackDown. After this, he would get something better to work with when he started a program with Mr. Kennedy that carried on throughout the rest of the year, one which saw the two battle it out in first blood and ambulance matches and even led to the Phenom re-teaming with Kane at one point to take on the duo of Kennedy and MVP. By early 2007 though, this would be in his rearview mirror as he'd then have set his sights on doing the one thing he'd never been able to up until that point, win the Royal Rumble. So this was how, at the titular show on January 28th, after getting the luck of the draw and coming in at number 30, the dead man would end up as one of the final two alongside Shawn Michaels, someone he hadn't shared the ring with since the late 90s. And from there, the two would have a mini-match which saw them each tease being eliminated multiple times, all before HBK would ultimately be dumped over the top rope as The Undertaker booked his ticket to the World Heavyweight title match at WrestleMania 23. But as it happened, the man holding that belt at this point was Batista, so understanding this represented maybe the biggest threat to his streak ever then, the number one contender would do everything he could to prepare, with the two eventually going one on one at the big show on April 1st, as after a hard fought battle that lasted almost 16 minutes, not only would the streak move up to 15-0, but a new champion would be crowned. And this would start a streak within a streak of sorts as, for the next six years thereafter, every match The Undertaker had at WrestleMania would end up being an absolute show stealer and would solidify the legend of the gimmick itself. But the next chapter in that was still a year away as, in the meantime, now the top dog on the blue brand once more, the Phenom had to defend against all comers, with him successfully doing this for the next couple of months up until the point that Edge would cash in his Money in the Bank contract on the May 11th episode of SmackDown and take the belt home for himself. And part of the reason this had been done was that the now former champion needed to take some time off so as to recover from a bicep injury, something which would keep him away from TV until September, at which point he would return to start a brief feud with Mark Henry. After that, he would re-enter the title picture once more when he got into a three-way program with Edge and then champion Batista, taking on the latter in a Hell in a Cell match at November 18th Survivor Series, then facing off against both in a triple threat match at the following month's Armageddon. Despite his best efforts though, the dead man would not be able to regain the World Heavyweight title during either of these encounters, and so, his next best shot at doing this would be to enter the Royal Rumble again in January of 2008, with this one echoing the past year's event when it started off with The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels entering at number 1 and 2 respectively. And in a moment of retribution, it would be HBK who ended up eliminating the man who had beaten him the year prior that night, with this forcing the Phenom to enter the Elimination Chamber the following month, there going up against Batista, Finley, The Great Khali, MVP, and Big Daddy V, and ending up winning the whole thing, booking himself a shot at Edge at WrestleMania 24 in the process. By the time the showcase of the Immortals came around again on March 30th then, he'd have spent a full month studying the Rated-R Superstar, 
enough so that in the match that followed, the Phenom would put on his second classic in a row, beating the champion by submission in 24 minutes and 3 seconds to win the World Heavyweight title again, and more importantly, take the streak to 16-0. Following this, he would defend against Edge again at April's Backlash. Due to shenanigans from Vicky Guerrero, however, the then SmackDown general manager and on-screen lover of the challenger, the belt would be declared vacant after the bout, with the two then continuing to battle it out back and forth for bragging rights for the rest of the spring and summer. And this would all climax at August 17th SummerSlam where, once again inside of Hell in a Cell, the Texan would retain his belt after chokeslamming the rated R superstar from the top of a ladder through the ring. So now, with his foe vanquished once and for all, he'd spend the rest of the year and heading into the next feuding with the likes of The Big Show and Jeff Hardy, with this continuing up until the point that, in the lead up to WrestleMania 25, he would receive a challenge from Shawn Michaels himself. Yes, after taking stock their legendary feud during the prior generation and their two recent meetings in back-to-back -back Royal Rumbles, HBK had decided if anyone could end the streak, it was him. And that was why he would make the challenge that March, one which The Undertaker would accept and which would see them face off on April 5th on the grandest stage of them all. But what made this one even more interesting was more than just the history between the two men because, as a born-again Christian who would descend from the rafters dressed in white during his entrance that night, HBK stood in stark contrast to the all-black demonic figure who instead came up from the fires below, leading the whole thing to be billed as a battle between heaven and hell. And in a contest worthy of such a moniker, what the two would put on once the bell rang has since gone on to be considered by many the greatest wrestling match of all time, one which kept fans on the edge of their seats throughout, and which after 30 minutes and 30 seconds of intense action would see the dead man make it 17-0. Yes, it was a career high for the Texas native, and one which would set an impossibly high bar going forward. So soon after this then, he would take some time off of TV to figure out where he was going to go next, eventually returning after a four-month hiatus to start a feud with then-world heavyweight champion CM Punk. And this would ultimately lead to them settling things inside of his signature match, Hell in a Cell, at October 4th, 2009's titular pay-per-view, with the challenger getting the win that night to start his third reign with that particular belt. After that, he would hold on to it until the following February's Elimination Chamber where, after undergoing a pretty scary moment prior to the titular match that saw a mistimed piece of pyro scorch his chest and face, leaving him with second-degree burns as a result, he would ultimately be beaten by Chris Jericho after Shawn Michaels had decided to interfere and cost him the title. Yes, unable to get over the defeat from the year prior, HBK had made it his mission to get another shot at the dead man, and after failing to win the Royal Rumble the month prior, he now saw this as his best way at getting the former champion to accept his challenge for a rematch. And this would work as it happened, but only with the added stipulation that, this time, if Michaels could not beat his opponent in WrestleMania 26, he would be forced to retire. So with everything on the line then, the streak versus career match would main event on March 28, 2010, and while it had huge standards to live up to, it, for the most part, was able to meet these, with some actually preferring it to the first encounter between the two the year prior. Ultimately though, once it was over, HBK's career would be the one that would end as, after pinning him in 24 minutes, the streak would move up to 18-0, and as such, the four-year run of show-stealing classics would continue. After that, the Phenom would take another hiatus to heal up, with the wear and tear of his lengthy career starting to get the better of him now, as it took longer and longer to recover after each big match. When he finally did return in May, he would enter into another program with Kane, one which saw the two feud over the World Heavyweight title across the summer and autumn. But realizing that his time was winding down by then, and that he would be best served putting someone else over strong, the Undertaker would lose all three of their pay-per-view encounters during this period, once in a no-holds-barred match at Night of Champions, then again in a Hell in a Cell match in October, and finally in a Buried Alive match later that same month. And this final defeat would see him disappear from TV once more for a while as he underwent surgery for a torn rotator cuff, something he hoped to get healed up in time for WrestleMania 27 the following year. Luckily then, he would be able to do just that, 
returning on the February 21st, 2011 episode of Raw and immediately being confronted by Triple H who, looking for revenge for his best friend Shawn Michaels, challenged the dead man to put his streak on the line at the showcase of the Immortals just six weeks later. But when the time for that match came, rather than act like the dominating force he had in years prior, the dead man was only just about able to eke out a win come the end of things, taking his record to 19-0, but leaving him so battered by the time it was done that he would have to be helped to the back, all while his opponent walked out on his own two feet. Yes, the story was now shifting to the idea that, as he got older, it was getting more and more difficult for the Texas boy to keep up his once-in-a-lifetime win streak. And that story would continue the next year, as at WrestleMania 28 on April 3, 2012, after not having had a single match for the year leading up to it, The Undertaker would defend his streak once more against Triple H, with this one being billed as the end of an era as, not only would it be settled inside Hell in a Cell, but Shawn Michaels would also be the special guest referee. So for the next 30 minutes and 47 seconds then, all three men would put on a masterclass of storytelling, with them managing to sell pretty much everyone watching on the fact that the streak was about to end when, at one point, the dead man took a sweet chin music pedigree combo and went down for a 2.99 count. But of course, he would kick out of this and, come the end, would have reigned supreme once more, racking up his 20th consecutive win at WrestleMania in the process. Such a perfect moment was it in fact that, after it was done, Mick Foley would contact his former rival and beg him to call it a day there, telling him there was no way he could ever top that. And as it happened, there wasn't any way he could. Had it stopped there, it might have been perfect, but unfortunately, things would continue on for a while yet. Sure, there would still be good matches, such as at WrestleMania 29 on April 7, 2013 when he defeated CM Punk to take the streak to 21-0, but by that point, it was clear that Age was catching up to the dead man, and try as he might to hide it, he had lost a step or two. So with this in mind, the result should have been obvious then when, after spending another year only making the odd cameo appearance on TV and mostly letting his body recover, the Phenom would come back for WrestleMania 30 on April 6, 2014 to face off against former UFC heavyweight champion Brock Lesnar. Of course, at the time, no one believed Brock had a chance of winning. After all, if anyone was going to get the rub from ending the streak, it would be a young up-and-comer like Roman Reigns or Bray Wyatt. And that's what made it all the more shocking then when, after hitting him with three F5s that night, the Beast pinned The Undertaker 1, 2, 3 in the middle of the ring, ending the streak after 24 years and leaving the 75,000 fans in attendance in a stunned silence. Yes, it was the moment most people thought they would never see by then, one that's since been described as wrestling's equivalent of the Red Wedding and ultimately a sign that Mark Calloway was mortal after all. But at least he'd been able to put someone over strong by the time it was all said and done as, from there, Brock would become the final boss of WWE, a position he continues to maintain up until this day. As for The Undertaker though, well, while many assumed that now that he'd lost at WrestleMania he would disappear into retirement, that turned out not to be the case as 12 months later, it was announced he would return at WrestleMania 31 on March 29, 2015, to face off against Bray Wyatt. Yes, the Phenom wasn't quite done yet, but now, with the excitement of the streak no longer there, and his age becoming more apparent with each passing year, it felt very much like his glory days were over. Sure, it was nice to see him come back, but there was definitely a sense by then that someone needed to take him aside and tell him to quit before he did any lasting damage to his legacy. So respected was he by his peers, however, no one dared say anything of the sort. So instead, fans were forced to watch as he limped on for another few years yet, as after beating Bray at that year's showcase of the Immortals, he would return to reignite his feud with Brock Lesnar in the summer of that year, having an admittedly great Hell in a Cell match in the process, all before slumping back down the following year when he defeated Shane McMahon at WrestleMania 32 in a pretty underwhelming bout. And by this point, it appeared that Mark Calloway also realized he'd missed his perfect moment to ride off into the sunset as, by then, he would become obsessed with having that one last great match that would allow him to finish things up on his terms. Achieving this, though, would be easier said than done, as by now, the years of wear and tear had left his body a wreck. 
That was why when he faced off against Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 33 on April 2nd, 2017, losing here for the second time at the Showcase of the Immortals, he would pretty much stink out the joint, with his hips looking so tender by then that he really had no business being in the ring at all. And things wouldn't fare much better the following year when he finally had his much-anticipated singles match with John Cena, a match that only ended up going for 2 minutes and 45 seconds, with this being necessary due to his physical limitations at the time. After that, he would manage to get in good enough shape again so as to have a full match when he went over to Saudi Arabia with WWE over the next couple of years, but each of these would end up faring worse than the last as it happened, with his singles match against Goldberg and his and Kane's tag match against D-Generation X being among the worst of his career. So maybe he would have more luck back at home then, he thought as, at Extreme Rules on July 14th, 2019, he would have his last in-ring bout to date when he teamed up with Roman Reigns to defeat Shane McMahon and Drew McIntyre. And sure, this was a better performance, but still not the one last great showing he needed to have so as to allow him to comfortably hang up his boots once and for all. Luckily then, he would finally get this at WrestleMania 36 on March 25, 2020, when he faced off against one of the best wrestlers in the world at the time, AJ Styles. And while this match was originally supposed to take place in the ring, as a result of the global shutdown that happened only weeks earlier, the two would be forced to get creative instead, as they put on the Boneyard match, a cinematic bout that allowed for the Phenom to work around his limitations while also paying homage to all three aspects of himself, the dead man, the American badass, and the real figure behind it all. And come the end of it, after winning and taking his overall record to 25-2, it seemed like Mark Calloway was finally content calling it a day as, from there, he would begin to drop his character in interviews, something he'd almost never done in the three decades prior. And this would even lead to a documentary series being filmed about his latter days in the ring called The Last Ride, a series which gave a lot of previously unseen insight into the man himself and which ended up being very well received by both fans and critics. Since that point, it's been announced that he will finally be inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame in March of 2022, with this seeming to close the book on his career once and for all. And what a career it's been. As for over three decades and multiple gimmick alterations, he was able to stay not only relevant, but at the absolute top of the card as one of the biggest stars in the industry and arguably the greatest gimmick of all time. Yes, whether it was Hulk Hogan, Steve Austin, John Cena, or Roman Reigns, they all had to go through the dead man at some point, and as such, each of them would have to learn that, while they may have been the big dog at various points, when it came down to it, they were all living in the Undertaker's yard, a yard that, whether he's actively wrestling in it or not, will always belong to him and him alone. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.